Ron Kovac is a guy who, well, in a lot of ways, he's a lot like me. He was in the Cub Scouts. He loved baseball. He had his baseball idols. He uh, wanted to be a good guy. He loved God. He loved his country. He loved President Kennedy. He wanted to be a hero. He decided he wanted to join the Marines and uh, fight because he had fought a lot as a kid with toy guns and machine guns and so forth. Top it all off, he was born on the 4th of July, so that every 4th of July when the country was celebrating his birthday, Ron Kovac was celebrating his birthday as well. The country was celebrating its birthday. Ron Kovac went to Vietnam and served not one but two tours of duty. And the second tour of duty, as you may already know, he was shot twice, once in the foot, and the second time, I think through his back, shattered his spinal cord, and he, Ron Kovac, was paralyzed from the chest down. This experience that he relates in his book called Born on the Fourth of July is one of the most painful and ugly experiences I've ever read about. And I've wanted to have him here on Midday to share some time with you for a long time. So Ron Kovac is with us. You may remember he nominated Fritz Efaw at the Democratic National Convention here in New York last summer. Last week he was arrested for the tenth time at Kent State protesting the controversy there about a gymnasium. Ron, you know how I feel about this. I'm fine. You. How are you? Good to see you. I want to share something. Uh, normally, I, if you're one of my regular you know, viewers, if you watch our show, I'm essentially pretty relaxed during the interview. I am not going to say what will happen to me during this. I have found reading this book, Born on the Fourth of July, which I finished at about 8, 8.20 this morning, to be a, a real emotional experience for me. I could feel your pain as I was reading this book. <clears throat> Let's not assume that everybody has read the book, or let's not assume that everybody knows everything about you. Let's uh, just find out a little bit about your well, background. I was born on the 4th of July in 1946, uh, and uh, I guess you could say I was an all-American boy. I love this country. I believed in what John Wayne said, and uh, Howdy Doody, Rudy Kazuti, Sergeant York. I was a child of the 50s. Uh, I can remember, uh, remember John F. Kennedy? Of course. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. I believe that, Bill. And uh, I believed in America, and I believed that what we were doing in Vietnam was right. And I went, like millions of other young when men. When did you first go, Ron? What, what year did you enlist? Uh, 1964, in? September, I joined uh, the United States Marine Corps because the uh, ad down at the post office said, uh, the Marine Corps builds men, body, mind, and spirit. And uh, I wanted to be a man, and I wanted Plus, to Plus, you were a pretty country. tough guy. I mean, you were a very you were an athlete. You were a star I was wrestler. The, uh, you I were was the best uh, pole vaulter at Massapequa High School. I was, uh, I was a real good wrestler, too. Yeah, I know that. So you joined the Marines, and uh, how did you feel about killing? I mean, you had played with guns and toys when you were a kid, just like I had, and just like a lot of people Well, the were. first person that I killed, Bill, was an American. And I didn't feel good about that at all. And the second group of people that I killed were Vietnamese children. And uh, that made me feel worse. But I uh, mean going into it, Ron. Yeah. I mean, you know, the whole mentality. I know. I, you know, I believe, that, I believe that all of us grew up with John Wayne, with whole movie, cinema image, the toy guns, the Madame Mattel submachine guns that we got every Christmas. The whole generation was prepped and hyped and, and conditioned by our culture, which is so violent and which, is so, uh, which so romanticizes war. We were ready to go. We were ready to fight. Uh, we thought that uh, the war was going to be like the John Wayne movies, but it wasn't. It was different. And when we came home and tried to tell the American public about the reality of the Vietnam War, that it wasn't a war to, uh, to help people, but it was a crime against humanity and against the Vietnamese people, then they didn't listen to us. They threw us in jail. They called me a traitor. They spit in my face. And, uh, uh, you've been arrested ten times, but I, I want to just, just try to go back a little bit more because we've, we've got enough time to talk about this today. Okay, Bill. To try to, uh, I, want, I don't want people who are watching now to dismiss you and to write you off as, as a radical, to write you off as a, a hippie. I want them to know what you were like. I want them to know Ron Kovac, the, the all-American boy part, and I want them to share, as I have shared, through reading this book in well, your catharsis. I, you know, what can I say? I well, no, I have uh, a couple of questions. Okay. I have a couple of questions. What about, to me personally, I never, I never wanted to fight in the war. I mean, I knew that if it came down to that, I might have to do it, right? I certainly didn't want to fight in Vietnam. I was in the National Guard. But how did you feel about the risk of getting wounded, about the risk of getting killed? I always had a fantasy, Bill, uh, about coming home wounded with a limp. I never thought that I would ever come back paralyzed. I never thought that I would ever come back from the war. Not being, able, uh, not being able to have sex again, and not being able to feel my body. I, I could never envision that. I, I romanticized 
that that I uh, that I would come home. Remember Henry Fleming and the Red Badge of Courage, yes. and, uh, the, the uh, classic by Stephen Crane. How how Henry Fleming in the beginning of the book pondered how he would act in combat, what it would like, what it would what would it be like for Henry Fleming to be wounded? And I would ponder and I would think about what it would be like coming home. And I always pictured myself uh, limping back to my hometown of Massapequa, Long Island, and all the girls running up to me and hugging me and kissing me, said, "Ron, you're a great hero," and getting into the Cadillac and being cheered and the the mayor of Massapequa pinning a medal on my chest, but never once, Bill, did I ever, did I ever think for a moment that I would come back from that war without a body, a living dead man, as I stated in the beginning of my book. I never thought for a moment, and I guess you could say that for all the young men that went to that war. We, we had an image of war that had been brought to us by the media, by the television, by the movies, by the... Remember the Sergeant Rock comic books, Bill? No, I never read those. But, I mean, I've seen, all, I've seen a lot of those movies. I, I had a different response than you. I always was dreadfully afraid of having something happen to me like has happened to you. So, for me, reading your book was so painful to share your transition to become a paralyzed person. It has always been one of, I think, the greatest fears of my life. And that's why I've, I've had such an emotional reaction to, to this as I have. I want to ask one other thing about the day that you were hit, if you don't mind talking about it. Sure. Because you describe it in the book. You describe You were hit in the foot, and you continued to fire. You continued to shoot, almost in a berserk way. Why didn't you, once you were hit, seek cover? You were out in the open, continuing to fire your rifle. Why did you do it? Did, did you feel invincible, like Superman or something? I felt that I couldn't go back. And if, you, if you've read the book carefully. I have you'll see that there are three events that led up to the moment when I got shot. And the first event was that people were demonstrating in the streets of America after I came back from my first tour of duty. I considered them traitors and volunteered and went back for a second tour You really tour of wanted duty. to show them. I wanted to prove to them and set an example as an American that, that, that uh, I was right and that we were right and that we were really defending democracy in Vietnam. That was one. Two, I went back for the second tour of duty, and while on a night patrol, I shot and killed an American soldier from Georgia, accidentally, which uh, suddenly traumatized me, and uh, I just felt incredible pain. The third was following that, there was a night ambush, and I really wanted to make up for killing the corporal, and I really wanted to make up for the fact that I had volunteered to go back a second time. Here, I had been trained for months and months in the Marine Corps boot camp to shoot at a silhouette 500 meters away, and I've been taught who the enemy was, he and now I had killed yet. an American. Yeah. And then the next thing that happened was I went out on a night ambush. I volunteered to go out. I wanted to make up for killing the American. I mean, I couldn't believe that this had happened to me, and I, I couldn't sleep at night. I, I walked around. I watched people look at me, and I, I mean, I was completely tormented. So I went on patrol, and what happened? Children and Vietnamese were killed and shot and maimed, and I had to pick up the body of a young man and, and pick up his foot and, and put him on a helicopter with tears streaming down my face. Another crushing trauma and tragedy. So finally, when January 20th, 1968 uh, uh, came, I, I couldn't, uh, once I was shot in the foot, I couldn't back up. I, I, I had tried to be an American hero. I had tried to serve my country. You were still wanting to be being. the hero. I wanted to be the more hero. More than ever. And, and, and I, had, I had killed, I had participated in the killing of these children and Vietnamese people. Uh, innocent killing. Uh, I had participated in the killing of an American. And here I, I was out in the open and my foot had just been uh, shot. And uh, I, part of me wanted to turn around and run and save my life. And another part of me felt. Uh, so, so uh, crushed and so frustrated, so desperate, that the only thing left was, was to move forward. And I, I stood up uh, with my foot uh, still numb from my knee down, and I began to move forward with my rifle, and then went down on my hands and knees, and my, my, my rifle jammed, and I could no longer put a bullet in the chamber. Finally, I took a round through my shoulder that uh, sent me back as if uh, uh, an express train had hit me, and uh, I remember taking a few short sucks, and. Uh, just at that moment, my, my body just disappeared from my chest down, and I felt like I had been hit by a mortar, or uh, someone had chopped my body in half, and I, I began to breathe slowly, and uh, I, I honestly believed at that moment that, that I was going to die. And as I, as I wrote in Born on the Fourth of July at the very end, at, the, at that very moment, what I felt was, if you don't mind, I said, Go. 
I felt that everything from my chest down was completely gone. I waited to die. I threw my hand back and felt my legs still there. I couldn't feel them, but they were still there. I was still alive. And for some reason, I started believing. I started believing I might not die. I might make it out of there and live and feel and go back home again. I could hardly breathe, and I was taking short little sucks with the one lung that I still had left. The blood was rolling off my flak jacket from the hole in my shoulder, and I couldn't feel the pain in my foot anymore. I couldn't even feel my body. I was frightened to death. I didn't think about praying. All I could feel was cheated. All I could feel was the worthlessness of dying right here in this place at this moment for nothing. 